that lecture, uh, one of the, the many aspects outlined by Julian was NetCDF. Um, and as you were looking, that's a core piece of middleware uh, for climate and weather research and uh, operations. Uh, in the session, we're going to continue on the topic of NetCDF uh, for, for geoscientific data storage. Um, with a quick review to remind you of some of the concepts from Julian's talk. Uh, but we're going to move on to think about um, overall really good practices and indeed best practice for the use of NetCDF uh, which, with such data. Um, so in particular, the session centers on uh, the, the CF predictions, which are a, a primary and a, a community driven standard for um, the provision of metadata to describe Earth science data stored as NetCDF. Um, explicitly, we'll cover um, a consistent and, and complementary um, set of open source Python tools, uh, which are designed specifically to, to work with um, uh, CF conventions compliant NetCDF data, um, which we're going to call CF NetCDF from now on, because obviously it's, it's quite a mouthful to say in full, uh, and to utilize uh, that metadata in the best way possible. Um, these tools basically will use the metadata to perform all sorts of operations that you might want to apply on a, a NetCDF data set. So, um, connecting it, reading and writing to disk, uh, analyzing it, uh, visualizing it, plotting it, um, um, all sorts. Um, so, I should start by saying these tools um, that I discussed uh, are developed by the team which I work for. Um, so, namely the NCAS CMS team. So, that's an, um, NCAS being short for the National Center for Strike Science. Uh, and CMS being short for the Computational Modeling Services Group. Um, so I, in fact, in fact, most of us are, are based um, at the University of Reading. Um, I'd like to quickly say just thanks to Easiness3 for the funding they provide for our work towards uh, CFNet CDF. And also before I do get going with, with the talk, I'd like to quickly acknowledge that the both NetCDF in itself and the, um, the CF conventions um, separately but in a related way, um, or as I guess as successful and widespread as they are um, in the earth science community due to um, kind of thriving international communities which help to develop and, and contribute um, and maintain them. Um, so there's actually decades of work has gone into each. Um, so I think it's just important to highlight all of that. Um, okay, so let me see if I can change slide. Perfect. Um, so to summarize, um, I guess I've kind of summarized the session ahead already, but uh, we'll be focusing in on um, CF NetCDF, which um, again is short for NetCDF data sets, which um, have metadata abiding by the CF conventions. Um, we're actually going to, uh, so Julian's covered um, the NetCDF um, data models. Um, and I'm going to use that to, um, as a starting point to um, cover um, components of CFNet CDF and then uh, um, think about data models for um, the CF itself, the CF conventions, and talk about the official one. Um, and yes, yeah, so this will be, um, as you, you should be used to from the summer school, this will be uh, about the theory and concepts in a kind of lecture style form. Um, and then um, later on, or probably straight after now, because the schedule obviously has changed a bit, um, We'll be doing the, the practical lab session where we can actually try out those Python CF data tools um, just as a demonstration of the, the capability of those. Um, OK, right, so, so let's begin uh, and just let's remind ourselves quickly about NetCDF. Um, so as Julian's covered, it is a file format. It's also a data model and an API. Um, so as a file, you'll, you'll recognize that this .nc file format um, and it's become very widespread um, in, in earth science as a standard for, for data storage, data exchange. Um, uh, so I've put, I've kind of summarized what I believe are, are the um, advantages and disadvantages, or at least in, in the context of this talk. Um, so, so with these green ticks, um, obviously NetCDF being self-describing and that you can provide the metadata to categorize each data array in the um, file. Um, um, machine um, independent, um, which makes it portable. Um, it's open source; it's not proprietary, which is which is absolutely great, and that helps um, means that you know anyone in the community or anyone who uses it can contribute and um, provide, um, say, bug reports or develop code for it, which is is fantastic. Um, and wide use as well; so it's not just a diverse community, uh, a wide community that. Um, um, 
can develop it's it's um it's get, it gets a lot of use and naturally the more it's, something is used the more it's effectively tested um which means it's um quite um uh rigorous and um um kind of low on on bugs etc um and it is very flexible so um in terms of what you can store uh, there's a lot of flexibility there but i'd argue that that's actually in a, in a sense it can be a disadvantage because or at least on its own it can be a disadvantage because that means um if you have um an etcdf file with certain metadata then the metadata can require interpretation um so i guess as an analogy um i would say if you say, say you give um a group of people um a certain fruit and you ask them all to describe that fruit um so say they say oh this is like a small round red fruit um and it could be you know an apple a cherry uh tomato um but all those descriptions was, would describe um uh, something that could be different um and actually when it comes to geoscientific quantities um they could be very subtle in terms of their context and their physical or, or bio geochemical nature um their units for example there's a lot to consider and um there are a large number of things that one description could apply to but that's you know it could apply to multiple different things and it's how you can identify the very specific precise thing um, unambig unambiguously um which um is something that netcdf on its own can't do in terms of metadata but if you have um 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 some sort of standard that goes with it and that's um what we'll be talking about now the cf conventions that means that um the interpretation is minimized um to the point um you know minimized in a sense that um you do as much as you can to stop there being multiple interpretations so that things can be um defined unambiguously and in a nice rigorous way um in these slides, I've put some recommended resources and links. Um, I'll probably not mention them as, as I talk, but basically, if you want further information, these are really good places to start. Um, okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so Julian discussed the underlying data model for NetCDF, uh, CDF in depth, uh, or the data models, I should say. Um, and um, I'll not repeat his review, but I think it's worth briefly just um, recapping because we're going to consider um, what will be a sensible data model for CF net CDF um, shortly. Um, so it's a good starting point. Um, so if you remember, there's there's two uh, data models to consider. There's the classic and there's the enhanced. Uh, and I've got the diagrams up here. Um, um, so in terms of the classic, um, you've got the three key elements um, um for say for for a data array what dimensions variables uh and attributes and in the enhanced model you still have those um but um instead of those being defined directly uh, on the data itself they're, they're defined within um a group um and it provides a kind of hierarchical group structure uh so this is a way to organize the data a bit like uh, directories in in um your file system on on linux say um and there can just be a single top level group um, a root group for an effective kind of flat structure um which is uh, comparable to, to the classic model um, and in fact it's, it's backward compatible the the enhanced uh, model um the groups are a key feature there and there's also um another feature that users can define uh, their own types so instead of just the, the primitive uh c types uh possible for uh, the classic model uh, users can define their own so for example there's uh, yeah, enumerations uh, compound types um, and then there's other, there's other differences uh, i haven't um touched upon on the slide just trying to get the key features there uh, i think such as uh, multiple unlimited dimensions being being permitted for the enhanced model uh, but yeah that's just a recap of the of the main points i guess um so to think about the cf conventions um so the name in full is climate and forecast uh, metadata conventions although generally we just refer to them as the cf conventions um well that's how they're known as more colloquial colloquially um um
Oh yeah, I've got that on the slide there. Yeah, sorry. Um, now I've described what they are in in brief, but it's, it's good to just consider in a bit more detail um, what they are, and in particular um, why they are needed. Because I've, I've touched upon that, I guess, in, in the slide. But um, um, just to go back to that concept of interpretation. Um, so, as I said before, to minimise the interpretation requirement on on NetCDF. Um, so that when people um, have set, pass a data set along, share it, um, they know precisely what the data describes um, without the, the interpretation, you know, is it an apple, is it a cherry, is it a tomato? I'm not sure based on what I know. Um, and when, yeah, so when data comes from different sources, you can therefore um, know whether it can be compared, whether it's um, comparable data, say, or whether it's something a bit different. Um, um, so in terms of the, the conventions themselves, um, so they are specifically for um, kind of earth sciences, earth system science. So they cover the atmosphere, surface and ocean. Um, that includes both um, kind of model um, data and observational um, say from satellites or uh, on the ground, um, um, and they try to be a definitive description um, to to remove the the ambiguity. Um, I guess the two different um, or the two core aspects are um, you've got your data to describe. Um, so what um, so you have a data variable, what it's actually representing. But also the context of that data, so um, the kind of space and time properties. Where is this located? Um, which is also essential to know. Really, it's no point knowing what something represents, but not, you know, knowing um, how it maps to space and time. Um, so there's a, a community process that actually develops the conventions. So there's no, there's no um, kind of leader who who makes all the decisions. It's all community process where things are decided. Uh, there is a governance panel, but it's all um, um, different. You know, anyone can contribute and anyone's views are considered. Um, um, yeah, so uh, there's, a, there's a dedicated website, which is a good place to, to um, look if you want to know more about those. But I guess that's a summary of the, the CF conventions in themselves. Um, so now let's consider kind of the elements of relevance to, to CF net CDF. Um, um, so that is CF compliant, so to speak, net CDF. Um, um, so one of the, the core, core purpose really of the convention is to provide um, conforming data sets with sufficient metadata that they're, they're self-describing. Remember, net self-describing um, is one of the kind of key benefits of, of net CDF. Um, um, so in a sense that if you have a variable in an etcdf file, um, it has um, a description of what it represents associated with it, um, which will tell you what the data represents and how to locate it in space and time. Um, so here we've just listed um, those three core elements of the netcdf data model, data, the dimension, variable, and attribute. Um, now, the dimension um, is um, fairly unambiguous in itself is kind of one um, um, description that could apply. But actually for the variables, when we're considering both the data and its um, space and time location, which in, in CF speak we call the domain. So I, I guess I'll get used to that terminology um, already um, because we'll be applying it in a few few slides. Um, so to describe both the, d the data, what the data represents and the uh, domain it has, um, you can actually categorize the variables in various different ways. So you've got the data variable itself, um, but also um, variables which describe, for example, there's the coordinates, um, properties of the cell, which is essentially um, in, in CF speak, this is uh, the kind of area or uh, volume on the earth that is represented um, by the data. because so it doesn't have to be a discrete point. Um, but usually, well, often it isn't. Um, um, equally with attributes, you can, you can um, categorize them in, in different ways. Um, now, this uh, the items in this table, um, 
um, created by my colleague um, David Hassell, who thought thought uh, long and hard about this this uh, problem, um, and, and this is essentially what he came up with. Um, it's probably more clear if I show them in a um, diagram. So this is a, a UML diagram. Um, I don't really have time to cover the the kind of the basics of, of UML, but um, if you're not familiar, then um, this is a I should say UML being the uh, the unified modeling language. Then please do look it up because uh, UML can um, such describes the the core components and their relationships, so kind of inheritance, correspondence. Um, various multiplicity you know, if, if something's one to one, um, for example, uh, as indicated by the arrows. Um, so, but these, um, so the components here are the elements in the table of the previous slide. Um, there is one abstraction to highlight. Um, so there's this generic coordinate variable, because if you noticed um, in the table before, there are, that maybe I'll just quickly go back on the slide. In terms of a coordinate variable, so a way to describe the coordinates of an axis or or an axis or or axes, um, um, you can have this coordinate variable, auxiliary coordinate, scalar coordinate uh, under the scheme. There's one abstraction there to um, contain those different types of coordinates. Um, but this basically shows the correspondence to NetCDF. There's three main components of the uh, the classic data model or the enhanced data model group. Um, um, so, okay, how, so how will we take all that and form a data model for SafeNet CDF? Um, so, of course, um, there'll be numerous data models possible, um, and I'm going to outline uh, the uh, an official one because um, one has emerged and been accepted by the CF conventions as the official data model. Um, and I think it's good to think about the benefits of having a single definitive data model rather than um, allowing anyone to just define their own um, as they require. Um, so again, it's about interpretation and uh, trying to minimize uh, the need for interpretation. Um, so this diagram kind of captures it. Say you, um, well, well, I guess the diagram describes not having a data model, but could equally it could be applied to, um, um, well, not having an official one, having you know, multiple um, informal ones. Um, so when you think about NetCDF um, under the CF conventions, um, without a CF um, um, data model, again, you can have multiple different interpretations uh, that might be applied by someone, say by someone's uh, software. Um, they might have you know, this informal interpretation of um, the CF conventions and how they're applied, um, which basically, um, yeah, means that different um, um, schemes and different um, software will apply their own interpretation and it won't be consistent. So it'll be very difficult to manage. Whereas with one interpretation, uh, sorry, with one, with the CF data model, it means there's only a single interpretation. And then if everyone uses that, then all the software can, um, and, all, and just people's thinking can be um, consistent and aligned. Um, so it does essentially um, uh, mean that it's easier to make software tools. It's easier to discuss CFNet CDF to provide enhancements, for example. Um, also, if you wanted to represent um, CF compliant data in another file format, not in CNET CDF, it makes it easier to translate. Um, and also just having a data model in a theoretical sense um, improves understanding of, of CFNet CDF because you are you're thinking about what are the, the distinct elements, what are the relationships between them. Um, okay, so let me just move on to the next slide. Where um, so this is the this is a diagram of and I'll just cover the official data model. Um, so I say official, um, it was accepted into the CF conventions. Um, on version, I think 1.9, current version. Um, uh, oh, actually, yeah, 1.9, I think it's due to be released. Um, this is all, this will all be on the CF Convergence website if you if you're to check. Um, might be in 1.8, actually. Oh, no, 1.6, yeah. Okay, I've got it on there on the side. Um, it was accepted into the official data model um, for CF 1.6 and 
essentially or guarantee to be consistent with the CF conventions for every every major version um, so or keep up to date um, and always be consistent. Um, now the diagram here in UML um, identifies that the fundamental elements um, of the the CF uh, data model, the official data model. So we call them them constructs. Uh, that's our terminology, metadata constructs in full, I guess. Um, and they're shown here in the diagram. So there's there's nine um, of, in this official CF data model. Um, so centrally is the field um, field construct, which corresponds to a CF PDF data variable. Um, so the domain, this terminology I introduced earlier, uh, provides the link between the field construct uh, and um, the constructs which describe, um, for example, the, the time location, things like um, and cell properties. So um, the cell being um, the uh, area or volume described by by the data, because as I say, it's not to be a discrete point. Um, uh, again, you've got the um, coordinate construct um, abstraction. Um, but in green, we've got these nine metadata constructs, which are core to, to the model. Um, touch a bit on this next. Um, so I guess the final thing to say quickly for this slide is that this official data model is necessary and sufficient in that it contains only the uh, elements needed to account for for the whole of CF, but nothing more. Um, I guess necessary and sufficient is quite a maths term, but basically it's um, it's minimal. It's not um, adding anything on. It's just saying how can we describe CF net CDF um, as a data model without um, you know just as it is. Okay, so in this um, slide, I've kind of combined the the diagrams I've shown so far. So let me just go back a few slides to kind of indicate what we've got here. So this in the box is just the official data model um, UML that we had here in the slide before. And then um, I've got new arrows pointing to components. These components are the ones, um, I've coloured them differently in blue, the ones here from um the gram the diagram which was um also the components in this table um so essentially the different categorizations of um components of cf net cdf um so there's more arrows there in, in a uml uh way to to show the full picture and how how those two map together um, in some cases it's fairly self-explanatory so you know the, the cell method construct um uh, it corresponds to cell methods. Um, it's quite, and you know, the, the cell measure construct corresponds to cell, to, to cell measure variables. Um, so another thing just to highlight here about the um, official data model is it's um, net CDF independent. So um, although we're describing um, CF net CDF uh, here, that's what we're talking about. It's um, actually the CF data model. You have to encode things to NetCDF. It's um, agnostic to the file format. Um, okay, so moving on to I guess the theme of, of the talk. Um, I think we're doing all right for time, actually. Yes, um, is using um, CF NetCDF because. Um, I guess you know, net CDF with the CF conventions basically give you a scheme to um, use um, or store and geoscientific geo data in a really efficient and um, thought out way. Um, so there are, there, there are many different tools that exist um, to, to work with net CDF. I'm sure you're, well, I imagine you're familiar with some of these. Um, um, for example, there's the command line tools, um, say NC dump that can help you see um, properties um, um, of, of an SCDF data set. Um, 
and I think many of them are open source. I'm not sure what the ratio would be from uh, between open source and proprietary, but there are certainly a lot of open source tools available um, as well as proprietary tools. If um, you know any of those, um, uh, the thing is, not not all of them recognize or or work um, um, efficiently with um, CF uh, metadata. Um, so the libraries I'm going to describe uh, shortly are built around CF um, metadata. So that's the, I guess, the central point that they were built up from, um, which I'm going to kind of describe as a USP, one of the USPs, um, unique selling points. Um, there are multiple Python libraries. I guess one of the themes of my talk is how to uh, manipulate um, and use um, NetCDF with Python, whereas you've been shown you know, a bit of how to do that with C. Um, so I should say there are multiple alternative Python libraries, um, um, and uh, I guess a core library that I should um, should just name check is NetCDF for Python, um, which allows you to use um, um, Python to to work with NetCDF four. And actually, the libraries I'll I'll talk about in a second are use that as a dependency, but they build on that to to add metadata capability. Um, so there's just some links there in case that's useful to you. Um, yes, so onto these these tools. Um, so in the title, I think I mentioned three of them. I guess they're the, the three I'm going to talk about in this talk, but there is actually a fourth. Um, so all, all four of these um, are open source. They're all on GitHub, um, all in Python 3. Um, and they're all complementary and consistent in that they're designed to build on one another and, and use um, um, the features from, from the others um, in a complementary way. Um, so first of all, there's CFDM, which is uh, a reference implementation of this CF data model that I've been discussing in previous slides. Um, so that's quite minimal. Um, largely, it is um, in Python what is required to, to read and write um, NetCDF data sets. Uh, with the CF net CDF um, and to say um, create these field constructs so that, that uh, one of those con uh, constructs from the, the data model I was showing you before create them um, inspect them modify them uh, so really the more um, um, I guess primitive equations that you might want to perform uh, then the CF Python uh, which is um, a data analysis library uh, it uses CFDM as a dependency, but it adds a lot of um, data analysis capability and further capabilities, such as um, the ability to, to regrid. Um, so it's it's much higher level, um, and you can do things, for example, um, collapse data, pr uh, perform statistical operations, um, subspace, regrid, uh, and I'm going to show you some of those certainly in the tutorial. Um, um, next to next, the CF plot. Um, now that in itself uses CF Python and um, builds upon it for visualization. Um, so essentially, it's as the name suggests, a plotting library. Um, so you can do various different types of plots and configure them in various different ways. Um, so contour, vector, line plots um, from the field constructs we have in CF Python. Um, finally, this one that I um, this tool that I won't speak about much, but I put some links here just because um, I already have so much time. But yeah, feel free to explore the links there if it's in, of interest to you. Uh, that is CF Checker. Um, so that's a utility that can check for the the CF compliance of um, of a data set you might have. So say you have a data set, you're, you're wondering is this abiding well by the CF conventions? That tool can can help you determine that. Um, because when I talk about CF compliant data, we're saying um, uh, I'm talking about it almost in a binary way. You know, it, it's CF compliant or it isn't. But actually, there's various shades. It might be um, it might be quite CF compliant, but there might be issues that are, you know, things that aren't CF compliant in the data set it could be fully CF compliant. It might be completely un CF compliant. But yeah, there are, there are different um, levels shades. Um, OK, yeah, so just going back to this field construct, which you remember is one of the central constructs of the, the CF data model. 
um, and naturally in CFDM and CFPython um, in those libraries, um, it's one of the, the core objects in the in the object oriented scheme. Um, the field construct again it represents CFNet CDF uh, CFNet CDF data variable um, with all of its metadata. It's not just the data variable itself, but all of the metadata that's associated with it. So everything that describes it. Um, so that in itself just consists of um, so descriptive property properties that apply to it as a whole. Um, so essentially, that's a name. That's a way to to name it. And uh, we call this in CF the standard name. Um, so towards the start of the talk, when I was talking about reducing the the um, need for interpretation. This is one of the key aspects of of, um, of doing that is, is having a standardized name. So basically there's a, a big list. Um, I think it's about 5000 names long nowadays. Roughly order of magnitude, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so there's this long um, list of, of standardized names with which you can use as, as the name to describe. Um, your field construct. Um, so instead of just calling it whatever you feel like that might be fairly descriptive, you know, your your um, something that's a fruit that's red, round, and um, small that might be an apple, tomato, cherry. Um, you actually give it a name that's known to um, known because it's encoded in this table to be something very specific. Um, and I guess we'll see some examples in the lab tutorial um, if that doesn't make sense. Um, yes, yeah, so the standard name for the field construct, the data array itself, obviously the actual data, and then all the metadata constructs, those um, nine or I guess eight, because we're not including the field construct uh, itself here, that describe the domain, so the location of each cell um, of the data array. Again, cell being the the um, um, some describe whether it, whether it's a point, whether it's um, some sort of localized area or volume, say. Um, okay, so I've put a link to um, the field, the, the data model um, page we have on our documentation for CFDM, which describes that in a bit more detail if you're interested. Um, so CFDM, I'll just quickly um, talk about in slightly more detail. Um, so as I said before, it's a reference implementation of the CF data model in Python, um, but that means it's a complete representation of CF in Python. Um, it's actually designed um, to be subclass, so it's not designed, but um, well, it can be used standalone, absolutely. Uh, if you want to do more primitive operations, you're not wanting to do more advanced data analysis that um, you'd, you'd need CF Python for. Um, but it's designed to be quite minimal so that it could be subclassed um, um, Basically, if someone wanted to um, create a new library that um, worked with um, CF, uh, provided some sort of utility for CF, um, the idea is that you'd, you'd subclass it um, uh, to make that as easy as possible to do. Um, and um, CF Python certainly has it as, as a dependency and uses all its um, logic to um, and builds upon it. Um, so CFDM in it itself it includes an even more minimal core implementation. So CFDM.core, which is its own kind of sub package in CFDM. Um, and that includes um, nothing more than the functionality in the data model itself. So not even um, mentioned CFDM has kind of reading and writing of data sets, um, but that's not implemented um, in CFDM core. That's Kind of builds on it, whereas CFDM core is just almost defining the objects that encapsulate the data model. Um, so the CFDM documentation is here. I think that's a really good starting place if you want to explore CFDM, as well as our, our lab tutorial, which we're going to go on to. Um, okay, so next CF Python, like I said, it builds upon CFDM. Um, so it is designed to enable you to do all sorts of data analysis. Um, that makes best use of the, the CF metadata. Um, so yeah, th that high level functionality is what it adds essentially. Um, so it's it's hard to list um, all the things that CF Python does in, in a concise way. But um, so I've, put, I've kind of put a list of some that might be illustrative or, or more uh, kind of more um, fundamentals that 
Um, so you can read and write NetCDF uh, or CDL, which is, you might be familiar, is a kind of um, plain text summary of a NetCDF file. Um, and, you, and when you read it in, it will become a field construct. It will become this um, core concept in the, in the CF data, data model. Um, you can inspect those in, in various different ways, various levels of detail. Uh, you can modify and analyze those fields constructs, uh, both the data and the metadata in various different ways. Um, again, make a best use of, of the metadata. Um, so say collapsing, um, um, taking subspaces. Um, you can do regridding, um, and we've several methods for that, uh, gridding ID interpolation. Um, you can combine field constructs um, in, in various different mathematical ways. Um, you can read and process the hierarchical groups of the enhanced data model as well. Um, so yeah, that's just a small example, and hopefully I'll demonstrate some of that capability in the lab tutorial. Uh, again, the documentation is here. That's a really good place to start if you want to explore. Uh, and CF plot next, um, as you might recall, saying it's the uh, the visualization tool that uses CF Python and allows you to plot the, the field constructs in various aspects. Um, although you can also plot kind of NumPy arrays um, on their own if you, if you wanted to. Um, so here's just an example plot created with with CF plot. Uh, so you can see there's a kind of this. Um, yeah, contours and then overlaid vectors, um, but you can conf configure it in, in different ways. Um, um, so again, there's the, the dedicated um, documentation, which is if you want to get a feel for some of the things, you can do some of the different visualization um, possibilities, then that's a great place to, to start to look at that. Uh, okay, so on to a summary, because we've covered uh, a lot and obviously there's not too much time to go into much detail about any of these but hopefully the the, the links i provided um, um should help you to explore more if you're, you're interested in any particular aspect um so overall we've been discussing net cdf files um which are compliant with the cf metadata conventions um cf net cdf as we've been we've been calling it for short um um, so CF NetCDF has become this community standard. Um, so if you're working in, in the earth sciences, it's very likely you'll encounter data sets that have some level of CF compliance. Hopefully you can have quite high levels of CF compliance um, or that you'll encounter people talking about, you know, standard names um, or concepts from the CF data model to describe that data. Um, but overall, um, the combination of CF and NetCDF um, allows you that flexible storage provided by um, NetCDF, but, um, and also in a self-describing way, but it minimizes the interpretation required so that the self, um, the, the description um, for each, um, well, for, for the data um, encoded in the NetCDF um, is, is unambiguous, or is, is at least as, as unambiguous as it can be. Um, um, so, of course, the different data models possible for CF Net CDF, but there's now an official one as of uh, um, version 1.6 of the CF conventions going forward. Um, it's all, and for every major version of the CF conventions, or I should say, minimum uh, minor version actually, um, so say 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, which is due out uh, soon, um, the data model is guaranteed to be up to date. So any feature that's in, say, CF 1.9 will be available in the CF data model. It's going to be consistent because, um, as I mentioned, it's necessary and sufficient and that it contains um, everything it needs to describe CF, but uh, without any um, extraneous um, aspects. Only what it needs to do that, no more. Um, and as I pointed out, there are numerous tools for working with NetCDF, um, including open source ones and Python ones. But the ones I've discussed and the ones that we're going to cover in the lab tutorial uh, are built upon um, the CF data model, which in itself is built um, to describe CF and CF conventions. So um, CF compliance uh, is at heart, really. And hopefully in the lab tutorial, I'll be able to demonstrate that when you 
have the metadata at heart, it, it helps you with your analysis because you can, based on the the um, fact there's not as much ambiguity, you can make certain assumptions um, or you know certain things that you otherwise wouldn't, which means that your analysis be can become more streamlined. Um, yes, and I've talked briefly about those tools, um, but yeah, I think it's best to actually work with them to, to see some of the capability there. Um, there's also CF Checker, which we're not going to cover in the lab tutorial, um, but yes, you might want to, to look at that as well. Um, okay, so that marks the end of the lecture component, I think, a decent amount of time. Um, we're going to spend roughly um, an equal amount of time doing the practical session, um, but I'll guide you through use of those Python tools for, for CF and AF. Uh, we're going to do that in a Jupyter notebook setting. Um, if you do have any questions at this point, though, I'm very happy to answer them. Um, I'll say quickly before I open up the floor to those, um, I should point out I've, I've put some um, hyperlinks with um, important websites, website links there here on the final slide. Um, um, so say if you didn't have any questions, you might have to explore some of those. Um, and also there's some hyperlinks throughout the, the slides because uh, I think it's Having slides is probably nice, but I think a lot of the information online is really, really good. So I'd encourage you to, to have a look at those and say the documentation for the tools as well. Um, yeah, so that's it for me for the for the lectures. So uh, thanks for listening, everyone. And do fire away with any any questions if you have them. Thanks. I'll look out for them. Um, if, if you know if people don't have questions, that's fine. But um, of course, if someone wants to ask something, that's fine. I mean, alternatively, uh, I guess I can provide my email as well. So if someone has a question later on, um, you know, you don't have to try and think of one now. Um, just a little bit. Let me get my share my email. I lost the tab. <laughs> Ah, there we go. Um, but I don't know if um, Julian or Jack, um, what you were thinking regarding, do, we, do I go straight on with the, the lab tutorial now? Do we want to have a very quick break or a 50 minute break? I'm not sure.